I would like to thank all of you for your participation in today's MPOC Science and Sustainability Engagement Series. The Malaysian Palm Oil Council, through the Science Environment and Sustainability Division, is pleased to present our science-based webinar to update the stakeholders from the oil palm industry on our latest and current developments in the area of sustainability, environment, health, and nutrition. Experts in relevant fields will be invited to present on this platform regularly to create awareness and knowledge building amongst industry uh, stakeholders. Today, I was, this is our third uh, series. Uh, the focus will be on shifting the focus will be on shifting the negative perception of palm oil um, and it will be organized uh, with four different speakers. The speakers will be both from the uh, R&D institution and uh, the industry. As we all know, oil palm is one of the favorite crop that has attracted uh, the world attention in uh, in, uh, in the production of palm oil. And uh, palm oil has been blamed for many uh, negative things uh, that are happening around the world. Um, for today, uh, we are quite fortunate to have four eminent speakers in the field of, um, in their respective field, to talk about um, what um, the benefits of palm oil. And um, we have four speakers today. Um, what I will do is that for this webinar, all the speakers will be allocated for, uh, 20 minutes uh, for their presentation. And um, all uh, during their pre presentation, there will be questions and answers. Uh, there will be questions being posted by the uh, participant, and all these questions will be collected and will be uh, posted at the very uh, last of uh, event, uh, last part of the event. Okay. Um, the first speaker for today is uh, Dr. Prakash Adhikari. Dr. Prakash was born in Nepal. He obtained his PhD from Chungnam National University of uh, South Korea. He has uh, experience working in large uh, vegetable oil producers, especially in the R&D, uh, in, in the development of new products as a senior scientist among the companies he has worked for is Wilma, Cargill, and currently is now the R&D leader at Mewa R&D Solution. Dr. Adhikari is a highly qualified R&D leader, all and fat expert with more than 15 years experience in research and development, mainly focusing on R&D strategy and innovation, product development, and technical services. Uh, his main technical responsibility currently is uh, include lipid modification, specialty fat development, oxidation and antioxidants, valorization of co-products from different fruits and all seeds, and new value creation for the organization. So uh, with his expertise, which extends to enzymatic and chemical intensification, uh, oils and fats processing, project management, crystallization behavior of fats and oil, analytical methods for fats and oil, and all products. So hopefully uh, we can have some new ideas and some um, new thoughts from Dr. Adhikari, who has had 20, more than 20 papers published in international journals. So uh, with that introduction, uh, Dr. Adhikari, um, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the palm oil functionality and versatility in the finished products. So uh, mainly the, my focus would be the, how we are using the palm oil and then every day, whether in our kitchen or wh whatever we are eating, whether we are consuming the palm oil or not, and then how it can be the versatile oil 
uh, how we can define as a versatile oil, why palm oil is different than others. Maybe these kind of things I will talk. And then uh, in the uh, finally, if you have any questions, then uh, I would be happy to answer. Okay, so mainly the palm oil, if we see the palm oil, we know the mainly the Malaysia and Indonesia are the main producers, but we know more than 3 billion people in the 150 country, more than 150 country are consuming palm oil as a source of dietary or as a source of edible oil that everybody knows that, right? And then it is the major ingredients for the cosmetics, pharmaceutical and nutraceutical products. Palm oil is one of the main products, more uh, ingredients. And then palm oil is rich in minor components. If we see about the tocopherol, tocotrienols, and then squalene, these are the very resource. Palm oil is the very resource of those kind of components. Then why, why palm oil is important is it is very, very good candidate for the dry fractionation. If we compare with the solvent fractionation, yes, there are some, some oils and fats can be modification or fractionate using the solvent, but we know environmental well, solvent is not environmental friendly, right? So that's why the dry fractionation is the good method. And then palm oil is very, very suitable to give multi-step fractionation to get your desired product. And another one is the, it has very broad functionality and then versatile application. Later on, I'll talk about the application part also. And then most popular non trans oils because we know the trans fatty acid is not good for our health. That's why how we can remove or eliminate the trans fat. Palm oil can be one of the ingredients which can really help to, uh, help to retard or eliminate the trans fatty acids type of oils. Okay, most of you already knows about the palm fruit, right? If you see here, the, the left-hand side, this is the fresh fruit bunch. And then in the right-hand side, if you see there, the palm fruit, this is the palm fruit. And then most important, the palm fruit is, you can see the kernel inside white color. And this kernel also have a oil. And then in the pulp, you can see if you squeeze the pulp, also you can get the oil. So this is very unique properties of the palm oil. Usually a kernel, most of the kernel or seeds have oil, but pulp, many, very few, or maybe there is no that kind of fruit or uh, have this kind of properties or this kind of phenomenon. Okay, for the source of oils, if you see the oil bear, bearing fruits and nuts, right? Many, there are soybean, sunflower, uh, cotton seed, canola. These are the oil bearing seeds. And then largest source of the seeds uh, oil is the seeds of the annual plants that everybody know, knows that, right? So as a byproduct, we can see also maize or Corn oil also we can get in the market, but that is the byproduct. This is not main product because when you produce the you uh, the starch, then the germ oil or the corn oil comes as a byproduct or co-product we can say, right? And there are some animal uh, sources for the oils and fats like a tallow, lards. They, these are also source of the oils and fats and the fish also yeah definitely for the health perspective fish oil is good for our health like a cod tuna salmon and herring and another one most important is the palm if we see the global oil yield uh, by crops and then the oil content we can see here there if we see this uh, palm oil contains per hectare if you see the tonnage per hectare palm oil is the most uh, oil yielding crop compared to others. If you see the others oil like a soybean or rapsic, they are one uh, metric ton per hectare. But if you see the palm oil has a more than uh, three metric ton per hectare. So the oil yield also palm oil has a much more oil yield compared to others. And then if you see the oil uh, content, also palm oil have a 35 to 45% of the oil compared to other oils. Yeah, some of the like a palm kernel also have a 45 to 
peanut has a 45 to 50%, and others are very comparable with palm oil. Yeah, another thing is the most important part of the saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. That means, what, what does that mean? Saturated means your oil becomes harder. If more saturation, then your, become, your oil becomes more harder. So in the room temperature also, it is solid. That's why if you see this data from this one, rough seed oil, 93% is unsaturated and 7% saturated. Sunflower, 90% unsaturated and 10% saturated. And coconut oil, 8% unsaturated and 92% saturated. But if you see the palm oil is very unique feature, 50% unsaturated and 50% saturated. That's why it has very unique property. So you can use palm oil in the many products. Okay, another one is the why palm oil is important because Palm oil, if you see the palm oil component, 1% is a minor component. Minor components is tocopherol, esterol, tocotrienol, phospholipids, squalene, carotene. And then palm oil also have, definitely as a crude palm oil, most of the oils have a free fatty acids. Also palm oil also have a three to 5% free fatty acids and six to 8% monodiglyceride, and then 86 to 90 percent triglyceride. Most of the oil have a higher triglyceride. So palm, but here what I am focusing is palm oil have a one percent minor component that is very good for our health. So it is very important for our health also. That's why palm oil is very important uh, in the functional properties also. Why we consider palm oil as a versatile? Just, just I'm listing some of the names here. Why the functionality of the versatility of the palm oil? Because palm oil has a high oxidation stability because it has 50% is the unsaturated and 50% unsaturated. So usually the saturated, higher the saturated, then higher the oxidative stability. That's why palm oil has higher oxidation stability. And palm oil is hard without any hydrogenation process. If you do the hydrogenation process, especially the partial hydrogenation, then there is some trans fatty acid formation. So you don't need to worry about the trans fat. So it is already hard, it naturally it's hard without hydrogenation. And you can use a trans-free solution. And stability in the beta prime crystal. This is usually in the application part. If you see the, there are three kinds of polymorphic form. One is alpha, beta prime, and beta. Alpha is very unstable, and then beta is very hard, stable, but it's very hard. But beta prime is usually in the margarine and sorting application in the bakery products. Beta prime is very important, and palm oil is, is stable in the beta prime form. So, and worldwide, if you want to grow the palm oil, it's very easy to grow, and because it has yield is higher than others. And another one is competitive price. In, in the old market, if you see the palm oil sprite is very, very competitive. And already I mentioned about the nutritional benefits. Palm oil has a minor 1% minor component. So it, is, it has nutritional uh, benefits. And it is very good feedstock for the enzymatic introspection. If you want to produce low trans margarine, shortening, spicy fat, infant formula, then it is very good feedstock for the introspection because usually in the introspection, you need one is hard fat and another is soft oil. So on that one, palm oil can be one of the feedstock. And another one is the, usually if you want to replace the animal fat, usually animal fat has a cholesterol level, high cholesterol level. So if you want to remove or if you want to replace the uh, uh, animal fat, then you can use the palm oil. That's why the palm oil considered as a versatile type of oil. Yeah, if we talk about the uh, TAG composition and the polymorphic form, if we see that the main TAG of the palm oil is POL, PPL, OOO, POO, POP or PPO, PPP, SOO and PSO. Usually the, this triacylglycerol is the main TAG in the palm oil. If you see the POA and POP is the almost more than 50%. And those are the crystallized in the 
beta prime pump. That is the most important in the palm oil. So just I want to talk about the modification. Of, there are several ways of the oil modification. Why we need modification? Because if we do not do the modification, there are very limited application. We can do a lot of application type of work. That's why we need to have a uh, uh, modification. So there, just like intensification, there are chemical and enzymatic type of intensification, hydrogenation also, partial land, the full hydrogenation, fractionation, dry and solvent fractionation, and blending. Yeah, there are many methods of the uh, modification, but those modification methods can widen the application of the oils and fats. It's not only palm, palm oil, but other fats and oils also. But if we see the palm oils, then we can use more palm oils in the dry fractionation process. So if we see here, there are some examples uh, in the palm oil. If we see the crude palm oil, in the crude palm oil, if we, we, if we do the refining, then we can get the uh, PFAD, okay? Then another part, if we separate the kernel, then we extract the oil, then we can get the palm kernel oil. Another part is the RBD palm oil. After the RBD palm oil, if we do the hydrogenation, then we can use that product in the sorting, or we can use at a hard start. And if we do the fractionation, then it can use for the chocolate. If we get the PMF 45, then it can use in the chocolate. And then another product is the palm olein. Palm olein can be used for the cooking and frying. And palm, if we do the again fractionation of the PMF 45, then we can get hard PMF, which can be very suitable for the uh, real uh, chocolate, especially the if you want to use the CBE, then you can use the P hard PMF. And there are other also, if we see here the fractionation uh, process in the palm stearine, we can get a lot of type of palm stearine. Just I put here IV 27 to 30, IV 36. 33, and then IV, low IV stearine called IV 10, 12, 15, 18. So these are very, very hard type of fat. This can be used at the uh, hard stuff for the bakery products or con confectionery product application. And then super olein, if you do more fractionation and if you get the super olein, then you can use in the, this oil for the spread or in the salad oil. Then, Palm kernel oil also have a, a lot of application for the like a CBS, and then you can use for the non-dairy creamer. If you do the fractionation or hydrogenation, there are many applications of the palm kernel oil also. Yeah, this figure is, I, I like this figure very much because this figure you can see from the palm oil. If you see the palm oil is the red one, dark red, and from one product, if you do the just the fractionation, more than 10 types of product, you can make it. Super olein, even I put here uh, IV60, 62, even you can go up to IV67. This is super olein. And then you can make very, very hard type of oil, IV10 to 12 also. So if you want to, get very hard as a hard stuff also, you can make it from the dry fractionation. And then if you want to make, uh, if you need the very liquid oil also, you can make it. So that's why palm oil is really the versatile type of oil. In the nature, there are very limited oil. You can get this kind of features. Here, I, I'm also, uh, I would like to talk about the palm kernel oil also because palm kernel oil also have a many, uh, many, if you do the fractionation or hydrogenation, you can do a lot of uh, products, you can make it. If you see the solid fat content, from the solid fat content from the palm kernel oil, you can make palm kernel olein and you can make like a palm kernel stearine, uh, IV5, IV7, or even the hydrogenated palm kernel stearine or the uh, CBS application, so you can make different types of products from one product. That's why we can say the versatility of the palm oil. Okay, this is also similar products. If we, I'm not going to talk in details on this because if you see the palm oil, 38 to 42, 
degrees centigrade melting point. You can use bakery fat, biscuit, uh, food service, and frying. And then if you do the hydrogenation palm oil, you can use distilled emulsifier flake powder fat. Palm oil in, you can use if the melting point is around 20 degrees, then you can use as a snack food manufacturer or cooking oil or frying. So hydrogenated palm oil, you can use dairy fat alternatives. Palm sterine, you can use for the pastry margarine or the soft manufacturer. So there are a lot of work in the super oil in, hydrogenated super oil in, palm meat fraction, palm meat uh, sterine, palm super sterile. So there are a lot of types of products you can make and then you can do the different types of application. Okay, this is the mainly the industrial application of the oils and fats. So even other oils also have this kind of application, but if you see the applicability, then palm oil you can use, most of these products you can use in the, uh, using the palm oil. So cake, pastry, all-purpose softening, and then cream, then you can use spread, cooking, all-purpose, then this kind of bottle oil also you can use, especially in the bottle oil, bottle oil you can use the very high IV oil in, like IV 67 or 65, then even this is more suitable on the humid or the high temperature country, uh, countries. This is just some examples I'm going to share about the, if you want to use cocoa butter alternatives. In the cocoa butter alternatives also, there are like a cocoa butter equivalent, cocoa butter substitute, cocoa butter replacer. From palm oil also, you can see here, I just put the palm oil as a cocoa butter equivalent. If you can use cocoa butter equivalent using the palm oil, palm meat fraction. And then if you use the exotic fat, like a CI stearine or sal stearine, then you can make the cocoa butter equivalent. So one of the major component is also palm meat fraction. And then cocoa butter substitute, definitely the HPST, hydrogenated palm stearine is, uh, palm cordial stearine is the uh, main uh, product for the uh, CBS. And then cocoa butter replacer, Cocoa butter replacer is also one of the uh, main component. You can use the palm stearin as a main component to make the cocoa butter replacer. So these are the main functionality of the palm oil because the, you can do the many modification and after that modification, you can create different types of products. Okay, if you see here, confectionery finished product, all the products, most of these products also can use the palm oil. Yeah, definitely, I'm not telling the only palm oil, there are other products also, other oil also can be used, but most of the oils, uh, mainly the, just if you use the palm oil or palm uh, oils fractions, then you can make several types of products. That's why initial, in the, my initial presentation, I mentioned about the, uh, in the 150 countries, the people are using the palm oil. And in the bakery application also, if you see the bakery also, all kinds of products you can make using the palm oil, like a pastry or cookies or cake, whatever the bread, you can use the palm oil. But it does not mean that you use 100% palm oil. It means that there are different fractions of the palm oil. Those fractions, you need to find out which fraction is suitable for you or the what maybe it may need to blending or it may, may need to do some modification uh, with the palm oil, then you can use those products for your final products. Okay, from this figure, you can see uh, food application, uh, food usage in the palm oil products. If you see here, I just list down some palm oil, palm oil, in, palm stearin, palm stearin hard, hardened palm oil, and double fractionated palm oil, PMF and PKO, all the products from the palm based oils. And then these all products can be used on this product, shortening, banaspati, margarine, frying, cooking, especially fat for the coating, ice cream, cookies, cracker, instant noodles, non-dairy creamers, biscuit and dog. All these products can be used, but you should find out, okay, here, which pro oil is suitable for which kind of application. For example, I can say palm oil is highly suitable for the shortening. And then 
banaspati for palm oil also suitable for the banaspati palm oil is suitable for the margarine similarly you should find out which is the best application for you and then you should identify which oil you need to buy or which oil you need to ask from the suppliers dr prakash could you please uh, i mean uh, you got one more minute yeah sure i'm going to finish yeah so this is the summary of the presentation uh, so how i would like to con conclude is the palm oil is the most globally used oil in the various application and then globally 35% uh, oil supplies in the 10% land use and then even without modification several finished product can be prepared with using the palm oil so palm oil has a very versatile melting profile after the modification globally competitive price and then versatile food application more than 50% of the packaged food which you can get in the supermarket also is from the palm oil and very good alternative for the animal fat replacement also is the palm oil so these are the main features of the palm oil and so we can say the versatility and the functionality of the palm oil is a huge so but just you need to find out which application is good for you so thank you very much if any questions uh, let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prakash, uh, for the interesting talk uh, entitled Palm Oil Functionality and Versatility in Finished Food Products. Okay, uh, we move on to our second speaker. Our second speaker today is Dr. Azmail Hassan from the Malaysian uh, Palm Oil Board. Dr. Azmail Haizam Ahmad Tamizi is the Head of Analytical and Quality Development Unit of the Malaysian Palm Oil Board. He obtained his PhD in Food and Nutritional Sciences from the University of Reading, UK. He also has got a master's degree in business administration from Anglia Ruskin University uh, 2017. Dr. Azmil's interests in our research are related to frying technology and food quality and safety. Dr. Azmil has published more than 40 peer-reviewed journals and technical publication. He's also involved in the technical working group on 3MCPDE and GE under the Council of Palm Oil Producing Countries. Technical Subcommittee for the National Food Safety System and Technical Subcommittee for the National Edible Oil and Fats. Today, Dr. Azmail will talk on palm oil processing and industrial contaminants, mitigation, update, and way forward. Without further ado, Dr. Azmail, the stage is yours and you have got 20 minutes for your presentation. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roslan, for your kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, today I will be giving a talk on the palm oil processing and industrial contaminants, mitigation updates, and the way forward. For my presentation, I will give some overview on the palm oil performance in 2021. I will also touch on the current food safety issues surrounding palm oil, which with the subject of 3MCPD and GE in processed palm oil. I will also share with you on some of the industrial data on how we mitigate the presence of 3MCPD and GE in processed palm oil and the initiative and the way forward on how we embrace and to improvise the standards and the quality of palm oil. And last and not least, I will also discuss a bit on the new food safety issues surrounding edible oil and fat, including palm oil. Now, in 2021, Malaysia has positioned itself as the fourth largest producers of oil and fats worldwide, which accounts for about 8.1% of the total global oil and fat produce. In terms of palm oil production, Malaysia is the second largest producer after Indonesia, represent, representing 
almost uh, about a quarter of the global palm oil trade. In terms of export, Malaysia exports 18.3% of palm oil, which constituted by 17.37 million tons of the total global oil and fats. For Malaysia, food safety and quality for palm oil is very important for us because Malaysia as the trading countries, evidenced by nearly 89% of our palm oil produce is meant for exportation. Furthermore, 85% of the palm oil produced and processed is used for product application as mentioned by the first speaker, Dr. Adikari. So in this presentation, I will give more emphasis on the hot issues on the food safety with regard to the three monochloropropane one to diol ester or in short, three MCPDE as well as glycidate ester or GE. The three MCPD issues has surfaced since 2019, and this issue is becoming prominent on the, on the 3rd May of 2016, where the European Food Safety Authority or EFSA has reported the levels of three MCPDE in vegetable oil and fats. If, you're, if you can see from the slide here, it is very prominent that seed oils like soya bean oil, sunflower oil, rapeseed oil, and, and even coconut oil contain 3 MCPD or of less than 1 ppm. And some of them are even lower, less than 0 0.5 ppm. But in the case of palm oil, you can see here the levels are very, is considerably high and reach as high as 3 ppm. So if, therefore, we are very serious about this and we are very concerned on the levels of 3 MCPDE in palm oil. So in order to understand the behavior of 3 MCPDE, we also have to understand what is the root cause of this formation as well as to see what is the possible strategy on how to mitigate the presence of these contaminants. So for the 3 MCPD, the precursor of the formation is due to the presence of chloride in the crude palm oil. When the crude palm oil undergo refining at high temperature, normally at 260 to 270 degrees Celsius, catalyzes by the acidic degumming, as well as the usage of the acid activated bleaching clay, it will trigger the formation of 3-MCPD. Whereas in the case of GE, the precursor is mainly due to the inherently higher levels of diacylglycerol or DAG in palm, in palm oil. However, for GE, it's easier to mitigate as compared to 3-MCPD. GE can be mitigated through additional process of post-refining at lower temperature. However, in the case of 3-MCPD, we have to ensure that the levels of chloride in CPO is low because once this compound is developed in the processed palm oil, it is very difficult or almost impossible to remove. Now, I would like to show you some overview on the research that has been carried out by MPOB. We have started our research work since 2009, and we have conducted many research uh, pilot plant trial up to 66 uh, pilot plant trial to investigate and to see the effectiveness of CPO washing to remove chloride from CPO and further refine to see the behavior of 3-MCPD in the processed palm oil. Throughout the year, we also have adopted the analysis of 3-MCPDE starting from the BFR method 008 back in 2010. And four years later, we adopted the method A, which can measure 3-MCPD as well as 2-MCPD and GE simultaneously using one method. We also conducted a continuous monitoring on the level of 3-MCPD and GE in 
commercial cooking oil, including palm oil and other liquid oil available in Malaysian supermarkets. Malaysian government also provide grant to the industrial players to see how the refinery and mills mitigate the presence of these contaminants. I will touch that later in my later slides. And we also collaborate with some of the grant recipient on the alternative method on how we can reduce the chloride content in CPO whilst reducing the capital cost of the technology being installed. Just to recap on the regulation on the GE, if you are know that the level of GE have been implemented by EU effectively on the 19th of March 2018. And if you look at this red box, the maximum level allowed for GE in edible oil and fats, including palm oil, is 1 ppm for normal use in food application. But if you look at three MCPD levels, which just enter on the 1st January 2021 this year, the levels is at two values, 1.25 ppm and 2.5 ppm. If you look closer to item 4.3.1, you can see here most of the liquid oils or seed oils falls under the lower tire, while other vegetable oils, including palm oil, is categorized as the higher level of 2.5 ppm. As elaborated by the first speaker, palm oil is very versatile. As you can see here, you can derive many palm oil products from palm oil, depending on the application, either in solid phase or the liquid phase. But here, I would like to emphasize on the partitioning of 3MCPD in different palm oil fractions. For example, if you are sending your oil to EU and you are targeting to trade super oil in at 2.5 ppm, manufacturer must ensure that the level of the hard stock palm oil is around 1.6 ppm before fractionation. Same goes for palm oil in, for example, if you are setting lower limit at 1.25 ppm, you have to make sure that the palm oil feed stock is around 1 ppm. So you have to work backward engineering so that you can meet the desired levels. So this is the, the flow chart of the palm oil mill. So we have identified the potential source of contaminant at the mills. If you look here, Uh, the red box here is the potential source of contaminants for chloride, sterilizer condensate, empty fruit bunch oil, steam or treated water, as well as the pressed fiber oils. And in the blue box is also the sources of chloride, for clarification, and fresh fruit bunch, which also the potential source of mosh and more mineral oil hydrocarbon, which I will also touch at the end of my presentation. At the refinery, the source of chloride coming from the bleaching sections, whereby for the three MCPDE and GE, high temperature at the deorization stage is prominent. However, for the GE, as mentioned earlier, it can be reduced when the oil undergo for additional process of post-refining. I also like to emphasize the, the level of chloride content in the phosphoric acid, citric acid, as well as the bleaching earth use. So you can see that the levels of chloride content in bleaching earth is, is considerably high. And therefore, it is also possible for the refineries to optimize and use more neutralized bleach, bleaching earth to ensure that we can control the formation of 3MCPD apart from CPO washing itself. So this is just to show you the correlation between 3-MCPDE and chloride. You can see here, the correlation is very strong, positive correlation, and the increase of chloride will contribute to higher 3-MCPD. So you can refer to the, this finding based on the 
recently published by Ms., uh, Mr. Lakshmanan, who is also one of our grant recipients. So the publication is very interesting and please have a look and read the papers. So how Malaysia is addressing 3MCPDE and GE in palm oil. So I would like to share here, uh, as mentioned earlier, in 2017, Malaysia have, Malaysian government have granted a total of 50 million ringgit to selected refineries and mills to carry out risk, uh, commercial trial to mitigate the formation of 3MCPDE and GE in refined oils. For, CP, uh, for the CPO washing, the removal of chloride from CPO can be carried out at either mills or refineries, whereby for the GE and 3MCPD, the mitigation strategies shall be carried out at the refineries. So this is just to show you the typical flow chart of commercial CPO washing system, which is offered by several technology provider. Basically, the system comprising of two system mixing of CPO with water at predetermined dosages, as well as the separator to separate the oil and water phase before undergo for drying using vacuum dryer. So this is to show you some of the commercial data on CPO washing at refining to reduce 3 MCPD and GE. You can see here the data on this C, uh, the effect of CPO washing in CPO. After washing, you can see the, the reduction is very prominent, almost 87%. And the reduction of GE upon refining of wash CPO is around 75%. So you can see here, this is the first refining steps and this representing the post-refining of the fraction of olein. So you can see here the, the difference are very prominent, especially for the GE, where post-refining has successfully reduced the level of GE. So this is another example of the effect of CPO washing at commercial mills. You can see here, the chloride levels is 7 ppm. And after washing, we managed to reduce to 1.3 ppm. And the formation of 3MCPD is very low, 1 ppm as compared to 3MCPD of unwashed CPO is around is almost 3 ppm. So in terms of reduction rate, you can see here, the total chloride content can be reduced at 81%, whereby the reduction in terms of 3MCPD is 67%. There are also research at the refinery investigated the effect of different quality of CPO on the rate of chloride removal during CPO washing. So the quality one is the standard quality of CPO, whereby the quality two is for the superior quality. So if you look here, the effect of water dosage is less prominent as compared to the quality itself. You can see that the effectiveness of chloride removal is very pronounced when we have high quality CPO. And a recently published by Mr. Lakshmanan on the effect of mild acidified water for CPO washing, which enhances the, the rate of chloride removal in CPO. And the table that I shown here is the selected quality parameters between unwashed CPO and washed CPO. So if you can see here, there is some improvement in terms of impurities, phosphorus content. And if you focus more on the chloride and 3MCPD, you can see that the improvement are very, very interesting and very prominent. And as I mentioned earlier, there are also some, there are also uh, grant recipients who are very innovative and have come up with a 
alternative process on how to reduce chloride content without having to use the separator to separate the oil phase and the water phase. So this process has been patented and instead of using separator, the technology applied the use of palm oil settling tank to, set, to settle down the oil phase and the water phase. And if you look at the trial, 17 trials that have been carried out, they managed to reduce up to 89% of chloride reduction in CPO after washing. And of course, when you do chemical refining, the level of 3MCPD and GE is very low. And you can see here, obviously from the slide that different treatment gave different levels of 3MCPD and you can see it's almost zero. We also conduct and publish the survey data on the level of 3MCPD and GE in cooking oil from local store in Malaysia. And you can see here, of course, in palm oil, the GE level is very high as compared to liquid oil. And you can see here, the 3MCPD, which is normally associated to palm oil, is also occurs in virgin olive oil products, as well as some selected oil like walnut oil, as well as peanut oil. So 3MCPD is also an issue for other oil and fats and not limited to palm oil. The important thing is to on how we mitigate the presence of this oil to ensure that the oil is quality and safe for consumption. And we also establish a method to detect the total chlorine content in all matrices based on the standard method on the determination of organic chloride content in mineral oil. So we have modified that method in such a way that it can also fit edible oil and fats. We have successfully developed and we managed to get good recovery within the acceptance rate and good reproducibility of the results. For your information, we also conduct multiple series of cross-check program to attest our method. And thank God, we all the labs participated in the cross-check managed to harmonize and get and, uh, and produce comparable results. We also in, wish to improve our Malaysian standard by making stringent levels of free fatty acid, moisture and impurities and dobe, as well as to include new parameters, to propose to include new parameters with regard to iron content, chloride and phosphorus. And currently we are revising our MPOB code of practice for palm oil mills by adopting the content from the COP of 3MCPD and GE which are already adopted by CODEX in 2019, as well as the MESTI certification from the Ministry of Health. So, and then once we manage to revise the COPM, we will include that as part of the normative reference for the Malaysian standard for MSPO. The inclusion of the mandatory food safety compliance in part four of the MSPO to ensure that the MSPO certification is more robust, sustainable and safe, and not, and at the same time, it will not dilute the overall sustainability principle in the MSPO itself. And I would like to share that our analysis for paraquat, as well as the total chloride content, three MCPD and GE, as well as elemental analysis is accredited under ISO 17025. So food safety issues is a never ending story. Now we are facing another food safety issue with regard to the presence of mineral oil hydrocarbon. There are two types of mineral oil hydrocarbon. The first one is the MOSH, mineral oil saturated hydrocarbon. And the second one is the mineral oil aromatic hydrocarbon. Even though there are no maximum limit has been implemented, there are some food manufacturers like Nestle have requested their supplier to supply their oil with the level that they have set for the hot stock. And this is the current effort that we are carrying out for now. So you can see here, we have sent the samples to different international labs in Europe and we 
also encounter that the, the results are inconsistent between established labs because the sample preparation is very challenging and harmonization method in sample preparation is very essential before we if, before the codex or any country wish to set the maximum limit of mosh and more in the near future so with that i end my presentation thank you for your kind attention thank you dr azmil for a very um, informative presentation um, we can see that the malaysian palm oil industry is moving forward trying to address some of the uh, current issues we are becoming uh, more and more important worldwide. Okay, our third speaker for today is Professor Smithy Gupta from the Wayne University, um, Wayne State University, Detroit, Michigan, USA. Professor Gupta has created a successful and sustainable program in the area of nutrition, disease and metabolomics with substantial external funding a respectable publication record, curriculum development, graduation of eight PhDs, 17 master's students, and close mentoring of more than 50 undergraduate students. In addition, she has collaborated with many scientists and in diverse areas of health science. Professor Gupta has published extensively on the benefit of tocotrienol in lung cancer and its currently a co-investigator on a clinical study investigating tocotrienols in patients of renal disease. Today, Professor Gupta will talk on the potential of palm phytonutrients in cancer management. Professor Gupta, the stage is yours and you have got 20 minutes. Thank you for the kind introduction and for the invite to um, participate in this webinar. It is much appreciated. Um, so cancer is one of the leading causes of death around the world. The rate of cancer mortality as shown by this chart from uh, the World Health Organization varies from country to country with countries uh, such as the US shown in dark blue having a very high rate of cancer mortality. Among the different cancer types, um, lung and bronchus cancer is very widely distributed around the world. And in the US, it is the leading cause of cancer incidence as well as cancer death in both males and females. So what is lung cancer? It is the uncontrolled growth of lung cells. And this can be categorized into three major categories, the non-small cell lung cancer, which is uh, about 87% of all patients who have lung cancer. And this is the one I will be talking about. And then we have the small cell cancer and the lung carcinoid tumor. The difficulty with lung cancer is uh, primary, primarily attributable to a very poor prognosis uh, defined by a low five-year survival rate of only 16%. So as compared to prostate cancer, which has a five-year survival rate of 99%, only 16% of the patients who get lung cancer survive after five years from diagnosis. So obviously there has been a lot of um, work done on the uh, production of chemotherapy uh, drugs uh, for lung cancer. And this slide shows the comparison of different treatment regimens on the survival rate of lung cancer patients. And as is quite obvious, there is uh, no significant advantage in either of the four regimens. So the industry, the pharmaceutical industry shifted their attention to uh, new drug targets and NOTCH um, is one of such, one such target because it is highly modulated in lung cancer. Gamma secretase is an enzyme which is key in the NOTCH uh, transcription pathway and therefore inhibiting gamma secretase can be a method to decrease the cell growth in lung cancer. However, as you can see that a lot of the drugs which have been developed against gamma secretase have either failed or are producing a lot of adverse effects. So then how can we uh, get some or produce some 
uh, regimen which will inhibit not signaling while uh, inhibiting the adverse effects of these uh, compounds. So our attention was turned to dietary bioactive compounds which have been shown to um, be effective as um, uh, in combinatorial uh, treatments. So here is where we came upon the oil palm phytonutrients. And um, as was shown before, the major production of uh, major crop or major product from palm fruit is palm oil, which is the oil extraction. The palm oil itself is very rich in uh, various bioactive compounds, including tocotrienols and carotenoids. However, there is another fraction uh, which is produced from the waste of the palm after the palm oil production. The palm oil pulp or the waste can be extracted by a water soluble process leading to the production of the oil palm phenolics, which have been shown now to have very high antioxidant uh, um, value and can be tested against cancer products. So I will talk about both of them, but I will start with the tocotrienols effects in lung cancer. So that's the chemical structure for tocotrienols. Because of the presence of various stereoisomers, you can have different isomers present. Uh, most of my work has been done with the delta isomer. Uh, researchers around the world have uh, done various pieces of work, uh, good work, uh, using breast cancer, colon cancer, and other models. So I will be looking at um, the effect of tocotrienols on lung cancer with our um, working hypotheses that the tocotrienols will behave as preventative or um, possibly therapeutic agents in non-small cell lung cancer. One of my earliest work, uh, published work on tocotrienol shows this slide. And we see that as we increase the concentration of tocotrienols, we see a decrease in the cell uh, proliferation of lung cancer, meaning that the cancer cells, you can see here in the control, they are very high in number. When you add tocotrienols, the number decreases significantly. Um, significantly. So after that, a series of tests, assays, work was done to see uh, and investigate the mechanism by which delta tocotrienols inhibit that lung cancer growth. So what we found essentially, and this has been published over many years, um, is that delta tocotrienol increases the um, expression of microRNA MEV34A, which is actually a tumor suppressor. So by increasing it, it helps to um, uh, it helps to, um, um, to to lower the cell growth for lung cancer. So by doing that, it inhibits notch one signaling, which I had mentioned before is key in controlling lung cancer. It also decreases NF kappa B. NF kappa B is a very potent inflammatory uh, signal transaction marker and is known to cause a lot of problems associated with cancer, including the toxicity to normal cells. So inhibiting that and the downstream genes, PARP, WEGF, MMP9, showed us that, uh, gave us inhibition of the lung cancer cell as well as migration and invasion. The two of them, so basically what it's saying is that you can stop the growth of lung cancer as well as inhibit its movement in the body, meaning that it can cause decrease of spread of the cancer to other parts. So having done this, we wanted to see whether tocotrienols can be used in conjunction with cisplatin, which is the current drug which is used against lung cancer. Again, one of the slides that I want to share is this. So here we have the control um, NF-kappa B activity in lung cancer cells. On treatment with uh, tocotrienols, this was considerably and significantly lowered. This is very positive because now we are lowering inflammation in the cancer patient. Interesting to note was when we gave cisplatin, which is the current drug, the NF-kappa B activity actually went up, which means it causes inflammation. And this combination of the two can actually reduce that inflammation caused by the drug. And similar effects were seen on the downstream genes as well, which gives us an idea that uh, the combination may work better than either delta tocotrienol alone, alone or cisplatin alone. So to put this in perspective, 
what we have shown is that the increase in NF-kappa B due to cisplatin, the drug, can actually be decreased by the addition of the delta topotrienol, thereby decreasing the inflammation and thereby decreasing some of the adverse effects and the drug resistance caused by, uh, um, caused by the use of cisplatin. So this is um, potentially a very interesting therapeutic combination, which I believe warrants um, further investigation in a human trial. Again, as a scientist, my question is, so what's the mechanism in between? So for that, we explored the metabolomic profiles or the change of those in the non-small cell lung cancer cells um, using tocotrienols. And then the question which follows, of course, is what are the metabolites responsible for that change? For this, uh, this slide shows the metabolomics approach uh, followed in my lab. Um, and I'll try to go through it uh, quickly, actually. So the samples are treated, uh, to, uh, treated with proton NMR spectroscopy. The spectra which are produced thereof are digitized and subjected to multivariate analysis techniques to see the effect of the drug. Now, um, and then one can go and identify the uh, metabolites or biomarkers which are causing the difference and then go on to see which uh, metabolic or biochemical pathways are altered because of the tocotrienol treatment. What I really want you to focus on in this slide is this plot over here. This is a PCA score plot, principal component analysis score plot. And um, I want you to understand that every dot, each dot on the score plot reflects the entire metabolomic profile of an individual. So if two dots are close to each other, it means that they are similar uh, in their biochemical profile and different from a dot which is further away in space in this plot. So if you see two clusters such as the one shown here and each of the cluster belongs to one treatment group, so for example, the control versus the treatment group, you know that the two clusters are quite different in their metabolomic profile. So going on to our study, uh, this is exactly what we saw. So here I see in the study that uh, the control cells, control lung cancer cells, showed a very different metabolomic profile as compared to, the, to those treated with the tocotrienols in both cell lines. So we have the A549 and the H1299 representing different cancer types. So the next question is of course, which are the metabolites which are leading to this difference? And these were identified and quantified and it's shown here. I won't go through the details, uh, but going on then to the pathway investigation, this is um, a, using a software called Metabo Analyst and do, uh, working on the software showed us that um, the glutamine and glutathione pathways were highly affected by tocotrienols. So when I went into literature and looked as to what glutamine does in the metabolism, there was a lot of documents looking at glutamine and the mTOR pathway. And so glutamine, um, so because glutamine was inhibited or the concentration of glutamine was reduced on tocotrienols, what it effectively does it is it decreases or inhibits the glutamine receptors, which in turn reduces or decreases the effectiveness of mTOR. mTOR, as some of you may be aware, is a key met metabolic regulator and helps to build up lipid synthesis, nucleotides, as well as proteins. So by inhibiting it, we are reducing the synthesis of lipids, nucleotides, and proteins, thereby reducing cell proliferation. So this was an important finding and was published a couple of years ago. So in conclusion for the uh, tocotrienol work, I wanna say that tocotrienols essentially lower cell growth or reduce cell growth by downregulation of NOTCH1, uh, a very important implication implicator in um, lung cancer, NF-kappa B, which leads to inflammation, and mTOR via changes in their metabolomic profiles. We also notice that delta tocotrienol reduces glutathione, which is also known to reduce inflammation. So this could also help 
to reduce the inflammation caused by cisplatin as well as um, reduce some of the drug resistance which occurs as a result of that. So this again, together, might be a good potential uh, uh, mechanism by which we can lead to sustained inhibition, migration, and invasion of lung cancer cells. And this particular uh, project was conducted using non-small cell lung cancer cells. Of course, we have to work on this in the human uh, uh, in in a, in a human trial to make sure that it is equally effective. So, switching gears, I will now talk about oil palm phenolics, and for this, for evaluating the um, the effect uh, of oil palm phenolics on cancer, we use the pancreatic cancer model, uh, which is also a very uh, difficult cancer to control because the five-year survival rate is even poorer. It is less than 5%. And therefore, when diagnosed, only 10% of patients actually can go through the surgery. Um, and the rest of them actually develop a lot of drug resistance. So most patients have to go through radiation and chemotherapy. And gemcitabine, which is the current drug of choice, um, is only effective in 10 to 15% of the population which has pancreatic cancer. So the obvious thought is, so what else can one do to help these patients? Again, we turn our attention to bioactive food components, which have shown some good results uh, in treatment and even um, increasing the survival time in certain models. Um, oil palm phenolics the composition of which uh, is listed here or shown in this reference um, was um, a process which was developed um, around um, 2011. And the key players who have been um, involved in the development and promotion of oil, oil palm phenolics in Malaysia are listed here. Um, and you can go into literature and look at more of their work if interested. Um, so we had a working hypothesis that oil palm phenolics will display uh, some sort of anti-carcinogenic properties in the pancreatic cancer model. In our first project, we actually investigated this in vitro uh, in pancreatic cancer cell lines, BXPC3 and PANC1. And to give you a gist of that work, of course, this involves a lot of uh, different uh, works, um, cell express, gene expression um, by PCR and protein expression by Western blots. But what is shown here is something which was done early on. And we see that increasing the concentration of oil palm phenolics decreases pancreatic cancer cell growth. So this was very promising. And again, the uh, gene expression of MMP9 was reduced by oil palm phenolics, and so was activity of NF-kappa B leading to lowered inflammation. MMP9 is a key gene involved in cell invasion and migration, which is what leads to uh, metastasis or the spread of cancer to different parts of the body. So lowering this is actually very important from the therapeutic viewpoint. Then we turned our attention to an animal model and looked at the in vivo effects of oil palm phenolics. For this, actually, we were very fortunate to uh, receive the triple transgenic mouse model from, um, which was developed by the Van Andel Institute in Michigan. And this has the three mutations, which makes it a clinically relevant model of human pancreatic ductal carcinoma. So for this, here's a study design. We had some control mice. This is without cancer. And then we have the KPC mice with the three mutations. And the KPC mice, all of them which who are going to get cancer, were divided into different dietary categories. The control mice, which got the regular diet, the palm phenolic uh, group, the, diet, the group which got gemcitabine is KG, and the group which got um, gemcitabine and OPP is KPG. So to cut a long story short, um, the effect of OPP on the tumor volume as measured by MRI is shown here. If you look at the differences in tumor volume in the KC group, KC is the control group with cancer, uh, the volume of tumor increases 
Whereas if you look at the KP group, animals from the KP group, we saw a significant reduction in tumor volume. That means the size of the tumor goes down. Now, the upper panel here shows what happens to the structure of cells, how the cell structure changes as pancreatic cancer progresses. And this, if you look at under the microscope, is shown at the bottom panel, or the lower panel. You see the normal cells in the pancreas are very clean. And as cancer progresses, you see a lot of lesions which develop, finally leading to the adenocarcinoma. So we looked at all of these tissues under the microscope and counted the number of lesions. And this slide shows the total number of pancreatic lesions which were present in each group. And we see that there's a significant decrease in the number of lesions um, in all of the um, treated groups as compared to the control groups who were on a controlled diet. This gave us some interest in the study, looking very interesting. And then we went on to look at the different tissues using uh, immunohistochemistry, which was, used, uh, which was done using S100P, which is a significant and specific marker for pancreatic cancer. And again, you can see that the control mice have a lot of this red color, which is showing the pancreatic tissue, uh, cancer tissue. And these mice have a much cleaner tissue. So uh, taken all of this together, we can say that OPP or oil palm phenolics reduce tumor progression. And this was seen in our studies with MRI, with histology, and further validated with immunohistochemistry. So now we go into more of the mechanistic side of it. Um, and we want to see what causes that reduction in tumor size. So for this, we turned our attention to gene expression. And the chart shown here on the left is um, looking at, um, it's basically an RT-PCR result showing the expression of uh, microRNA MIR-451A. And you see that there is an increase in the expression of MIR-451A, again, a tumor uh, suppressor, suppressor. So increasing it will tend to reduce the size or the spread of the tumors. So uh, in a gist, we can say, or in a nutshell, we can say that oil palm phenolics increases tumor, uh, the tumor suppression mirror 451A, leading to a decrease in BCL2 surviving expression, which decreases tumor volume. And also it leads to a decrease in MMP9 expression, again, a key factor for the spread of cancer. So therefore it causes a decrease in the migration or tumor progression, as well as a number of tumors. Further, we wanted to look at the changes in the metabolomic profiles and the metabolites which are responsible for the difference. So here again is a PCA score plot, which shows that the control animals shown in red have a very different metabolomic profile as compared to the treated animals. In this case, the um, animals fed the palm, oil palm phenolics. On the right, I have listed the metabolites which were higher in concentration in the palm, oil palm phenolics fed animals as compared to the metabolites on the left, which were higher in concentration in the uh, control group. And looking at these metabolites and trying to figure out which pathways they belong to, we notice from literature that taurine is highly implicated in many cancer types. It tends to be lower in concentration in the plasma, but much higher in concentration in the urine of patients with different cancer types. So we showed that it's also true for pancreatic cancer. So summing all of this together, I would like to conclude that dietary oil palm phenolics arrested or stopped the growth of pancreatic cancer in the triple transgenic mouse model, which as I said, is a very relevant uh, model for human uh, pancreatic cancer. And they did so by increasing the tumor suppressor, MIR-451, by decreasing taurine concentrations, which is very important for cancer um, prevention. Um, this further, the downstream um, but, uh, the downstream gene expressions of BCL2 and survivin were decreased, as well as cycling D1 increased, which shows that the cell cycle was arrested. And this led to a decrease in tumor volume, as I pointed out in the MRI data before. 
and the decrease in MMP9 expression led to a decrease in the invasion, that means the spreading or metastasis of the tumors. And this was again shown by histological evidence earlier. So with that, keeping the two in mind, the thought that I've been having is to look at the possible synergism of oil palm phenolics and topotrienol. One is a water-soluble uh, uh, molecule. The OPP molecules are soluble in water, whereas topotrienol is soluble in a fat, is present in the palm oil. So how do we combine these together? And if we do, will it have a synergistic or an additive effect? The thought is that because Delta tocotrienol works from with a similar yet different mechanism than oil palm phenolics in, the, in terms of the different expressions of different RNA, MIR34A in case of Delta tocotrienol, MIR451A in case of OPP, leading to differences in the metabolite profiles, decrease in the glutamine a metabolic pathway in case of delta tocotrienols, whereas um, taurine is uh, highly implicated in the palm phenolics pathway. The possibility is that the two together might actually help to promote detoxification, have a greater antioxidation effect and greater mitochondrial function, leading to possible potential sustained inhibition, migration, and invasion of either cell type the uh, non-small cell lung cancer that we've investigated or the pancreatic cancer. So this would be one of the studies which I would like to do in the future as well. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank you all for your kind attention and you can never thank your students enough. So Ming here and uh, Raj were the two involved in the tocotrienol study and Nadia and Arvind did the work on the oil palm phenolics. Um, MPOB has been very generous to the ZIP funds for the palm phenolic fraction, and I thank uh, the project and I thank them for that. Um, MPOC has funded my previous studies, uh, small ones, uh, and I would like to give my thanks to MPOC as well, as well to Van Andel Institute. Um, without the mice, we would have not been able to do the study. So thank you all. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Gupta for a very uh, interesting talk on the uh, potential of palm oil, especially in addressing cancer. Okay, um, we are quite honored to have a celebrity as our first speaker, uh, Dr. Joni Bowden. Uh, Dr. Joni Bowden is a board certified nutritionist. He's also a best selling author of 15 books and a nationally known expert on weight loss and anti-aging. His no-nonsense, myth-busting approach has made him a popular guest on television. Dr. Us, Do The Doctors, ABC TV, MSNBC TV, CNN, CBS TV, CBN, and the list go on and on and on. So he's a popular speaker at venues ranging from Beijing University to the American Academy of Aging Medicine. Today, we are fortunate to listen to Dr. Bowden to speak on a very interesting topic, making sense of dietary fats, the truth about palm oil. With that introduction, Dr. Bowden, you have got uh, 20 minutes for your presentation. Dr. Borden, I think you are muted. Could you please speak a little bit louder? Dr. Borden, we cannot hear you.
Amal, could you please assist? Oh boy. Button. We can't hear you there. You don't hear me? Okay, now it's loud and clear. You can? Yes. Ah, thank goodness. Okay, I'll start again. First of all, thank you for that beautiful and very embarrassingly flattering. <laughs> Uh, I'm very honored to be here among such scientists and, and distinguished people. I am the guy that goes on popular television and explains what you guys do to people who don't have a scientific background. And I'm called the Nutrition Mythbuster, and, uh, the, which makes me kind of perfectly suited to talk about palm oil because it is the subject of so many myths and so many misconceptions and in 20 short minutes i'm going to try to tell you how i talk to the american public about those misconceptions um it's a wonderful oil as as i'm sure you all know and and as i believe and and there's a lot of myths about it so let's get started uh, I, these are the television shows. This is what I do. I go around and, and I get interviewed and people ask me questions. And very often the things that come up when we talk about palm oil, the biggest one uh, is, but it's a saturated fat. Isn't it going to cause heart disease? So that's what I'm going to kind of focus on because that's what the general public thinks of when they think of the bad publicity for palm oil. It's that and the sustainability thing, which I'm also going to get to in a minute. So I'm all about busting myths about things, and fat is certainly one of them. I was in a movie. It's a wonderful movie. You can rent it on Amazon called Fat Fiction that actually explored all of the many fats about uh, uh, so many fictions about fat. So what are some of them? Let's look at them quickly. Eating fat makes you fat. It doesn't. Actually, eating fat doesn't raise the fat, uh, the fat storing hormone insulin. It has no effect on insulin, whereas carbohydrates drive it to the rooftop. So it actually does not make you fat. That's why people do very well on high fat diets when they bring down uh, sugar and starch. Uh, saturated fat clogs your arteries. This is the big rap against palm oil and coconut oil and animal products. And it's not True. When I have a longer time to do this presentation, I go through study after study after study, starting with 2010 American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. I have a couple of slides about it later, but the studies are very clear. Saturated fat doesn't clog the arteries, and saturated fat is not associated with an increase in, in death from heart disease. And I know that may be even surprising to some of you, but it is in the research. Um, and then this myth, which is that it's healthy to substitute vegetable oils for saturated fat. And, and if I had more time, I'd tell you some very funny stories about studies that have been done on that. But let me just tell you that it is not true. We'll get to later how bad this information is, because vegetable oils are probably one of the two most inflammatory things in the American diet. And we eat them and we consume them because we have been told that saturated fat is bad, which it isn't. And palm oil, being a saturated fat, has gotten a lot of that bad publicity and one of my jobs is to disseminate the truth about that and and dispel that particular myth and finally the myth that good versus bad fat is all about saturated versus unsaturated our research shows that is not the case there's a ton of research that supports that i'm not going to go through all the science because i want you to know how i talk to the general public about that but the fact is that there are unsaturated fats that are toxic waste dumps and there are saturated fats such as malaysian palm oil and coconut oil and things like that that are actually very very good for us so this division is not a saturated versus unsaturated or an animal versus a vegetable division and finally the notion that saturated fat raises cholesterol, which in turn causes heart disease. And that simply isn't true. Uh, we wrote a book about this. I, I teamed up with a cardiologist named Stephen Sinatra. This isn't a, a big plug for my book. It's just to tell you that there are 212 scientific references in this book that support what we argue, which is that the uh, blame for heart disease on saturated fat and cholesterol is misplaced. Now, how did we get this wrong? It's a very interesting story for those of you who, who are interested in this kind of thing. It's been told many times, and I don't want to use up a lot of time, but we had a president here in America, 1953, Dwight Eisenhower. Everybody loved him. He was in great shape. We didn't know that smoking was bad for you. He gets a heart attack. 
we didn't really know a lot about heart attacks in 1953. You know, cardiology wasn't even invented as a profession until the first part of the 20th century. It wasn't that common. People went nuts the way they are for COVID now. We needed explanations. There weren't really any explanations. Why did this guy have a heart attack? Because now we know he smoked and we know a lot of other things that we didn't know then. But there were theories all over the place. And one of the theories was that, well, why did, why did, why do your arteries get clogged? Well, there was some, some observational evidence, some epidemiological studies that seemed to associate countries that ate a lot of fat, seemed to have a lot of heart disease, like the United States. Of course, they didn't account for confounding variables like stress and the quality of the carbohydrates and the amount of exercise people got, but they found some association, some observations that said, well, it seems like the countries that eat a lot of fat, they have a lot of heart disease. And they pushed these theories through and they simply weren't true. And now you guys probably know about epidemiology. Do I have that slide yet? Epidemiology makes astrology look respectable. I always explain to, to general audiences that epidemiology is the redheaded stepsister of science. It's wonderful for generating hypotheses. It's not very wonderful for generating health policies and social policies. And, and the example that I give, hopefully you'll find this amusing, audiences always do. This is how I explain that correlation does not equal causation. There is a perfectly statistically measurable correlation between the number of storks and the number of babies in Denmark. There is, and I'll repeat that, there's a statistically significant correlation between storks and babies in Denmark. Would you like to know why? Because storks like to nest in slanted, sticky surfaces. In Denmark, singles, single people live in the cities and when they want to get married and start families, they move to the suburbs. And this is what the houses look like in the suburbs when they go out there to have babies. And that's where the storks nest. And that's why there's a correlation. So the storks don't cause the babies. And every audience understands that. That's what the correlational studies that damned saturated fat were like. They were correlational studies. There were no, there is one clinical study, which I'll tell you about in a minute, that compared vegetable oil to saturated fat. The rest of it is all guessing from epidemiological studies. And it resulted in this, in the United States and worldwide. We were just absolutely terrified of fat. We, we came up with all of this junk. I always put this slide in when I talk to general audiences because they kind of get the point very fast. We did not see very much success with low fat diets. They simply don't work. So um, how do we know that they were wrong? How do we know the low fat people were wrong? By research. And again, I'm very conscious of the time. I usually have a lot more time and I love to go through these studies. I'm just gonna put them up there to show you that they exist. Uh, and every one of them has confirmed what I'm telling you, saturated fat does not correlate with heart disease. It doesn't increase the risk. And it's been written up in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, looking at the questionable link between saturated fat and heart disease. The general public doesn't always know this, but it's true. So the argument against palm oil based on the fact that it has saturated fat is a bogus argument. And I'm here to tell you that, and I'm here to, to debate anybody who wants to say differently. Um, so why do doctors and so many other people not change their minds. Well, I always like to show this quote. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his job depends upon his not understanding it. So that's where I come in. And the way I saw this, the way I got involved in this fight for nutritional truth and, and for just truth in general, is that I started out as a trainer, as, a, as a, a person who teaches people how to exercise and get into, in, into health at a place called Equinox Fitness Clubs. It's, a lar it's one of the largest and most luxurious chains in America. And I believed in the low fat diet and I told people don't eat palm oil, don't eat coconut oil, don't eat animal products, eat vegetarian. And I told them that and I told them to eat these diets and I did not see the results we were supposed to be seeing. We just didn't see it. And we started to question the conventional wisdom. And that's how I got into conventional, into questioning conventional wisdom in general.
And it wound up questioning the conventional wisdom enough to actually look at the research and say, I think we've been taught a bill of goods when it comes to saturated fat, cholesterol, and the connection to heart disease. I think we're on the wrong track. It wound us up on a very famous show in America called The, the Dr. Oz Show. This is, this is from a book on healthy foods. And it gives a star to red palm oil. In a book of the 150 healthiest foods on earth, this one got a star. And do you know how I know this information is correct? Because I wrote the book. <laughs> and I'm telling you that because this book has been in print. This is the 10th anniversary edition. It's been translated to four languages. There's 250,000 copies and growing. And I say and explain why and give the references why this is a superfood. It is not something to be aborted. It is something to be encouraged. So why? We had a wonderful presentation, far more scientific and, 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 um, uh, and erudite than I, than I would be able to do on the benefits of tocotrienols. I mean, this magnificent compound from vitamin E that people don't even talk about or know about that is so good for the brain. This is why people sell supplements of tocotrienols and palm oil, that these companies sell this in America. And I show this to my audiences. Do you think they sell supplements from corn oil or safflower oil? This is marketing copy from one of the companies selling it, but you know what? It's true, only natural. It's a rich source of vitamins, antioxidants, including tocotrienols, and it may assist with the reduction of body fat and contribute, contribute to general wellness. This is a great food, ladies and gentlemen. I know you know that. The effect on the brain of tocotrienols, the, the ability of tocotrienols to protect the brain after a stroke, and that's in the literature as well. Uh, this is some of the literature from stroke, from the journal Stroke, in fact, about the, the protective effects of tocotrienols on brain white matter. And the other thing that makes palm oil so important in our diet, and I tell this to audiences and they're beginning to understand it, is that it's not inflammatory. And one of the most inflammatory things in the American diet, you're going to see it in a minute, is vegetable oil. Now, I don't go so far as to say palm oil is anti-inflammatory, but it doesn't matter. It's not pro-inflammatory, and every one of those other oils is. So here you have a neutral, as far as inflammation, a neutral oil with, health, with decided health benefits from the, from the tocotrienols and the carotenoids. And it stands up to heat. And it's non-GMO. And it has no trans fats. And it doesn't contribute to inflammation. And please look at this, because this chart is 100% true. Inflammation, oxidative damage, the twin towers of cellular destruction, they are at the cause, they are at the root, they accompany every chronic disease. We don't need more inflammation in our edible oils. And that's exactly what we get, but we don't get it from palm oil. Now, what are the two most pro-inflammatory things in the American diet. The first is sugar. Guess what the second is? You guessed it, vegetable oil. And, and I wish, I don't, I don't know how much time that I have. Uh, yeah, I wish I had time to tell you about the one and only clinical study that ever actually tested the hypothesis that if you substitute saturated fat with vegetable oil, you will have a reduction in risk factors. Uh, if, if you, if, if, there, if I ever have a chance to talk to you again, I will tell you that story, but I'll tell you the result right now. It was from the Minnesota Heart Study, the only clinical trial ever that randomized people to either the, the butter content or the margarine content, the saturated fat content or the vegetable oil. And what happened was that the people having the vegetable oil had higher risks for heart disease and death. Higher, not lower. I want to point this out, and I'm going to go a little rogue here. You know, in our field in nutrition, the big war on fat turned out to be largely funded by the sugar industry. This is not conspiracy theory stuff. This happened. The papers were actually, uh, the, the, the found papers, the industry documents were released in the Journal of American Medical Association. That's not some, you know, crazy uh, journal. And the sugar industry actually paid to shift the blame to fat so that nobody would look at it. And my question to you, industry, is who benefits from this bad publicity on palm oil? Who, who benefits by taking the attention off the fact that these vegetable oils 
Half of them are GMO, soybean oil, 92% is GMO, corn, same thing. They're processed within an inch of their lives. They have no nutritional advantages. Who benefits from everybody focusing on palm oil? I would like to know that. That's be the question that I would ask. Because palm oil has an unfair advantage in the marketplace, guys. Huge production yields can be produced sustainably, is being produced sustainably. It's non-GMO, it doesn't have trans fats, and relative to corn and safflower and sunflower and soybean, it's relatively inexpensive, and it has a smaller footprint. Who doesn't want you to know that? That's just my thinking as a nutritionist, having observed what happened with sugar and fat. I wonder, I don't think you can say this about corn oil. Health benefits of palm oil. There, there are no slides like this. Health benefits of cottonseed oil, canola oil. Sorry. Last, I want to close with this wonderful study because my, my, my old friend Sundram did this study a, a year or so ago, maybe a year and a half. And it's such a wonderful study because it stops putting the question on, on uh, it, it stops looking at nutrients as if they happen in a vacuum. We don't just eat saturated fat. We don't just eat a carbohydrate. We don't just eat sugar. We eat patterns. We eat, uh, we eat meals. We eat collections of nutrients and macronutrients. We eat uh, in, 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 a, in a style or a manner, not in terms of eating you know, specific components of the diet. So what he did was he actually tested different ways of eating, different styles of eating among a population. He tested a high carb, high fat pattern. He tested a high fat, low carb pattern, like the keto diet, low fat and low carb, the carnivore diet, all meat. And finally, the last one, the food pyramid one, patterns. Now, in the way he did the study in Malaysia, so almost all, if not all, 80%, I believe, of the fat that was consumed was palm oil. So across the board, whether it was low fat, high fat, medium fat, no fat, whatever, it was the fat was palm oil. So that was not a factor here. And what they found, and they measured, what I love about this study is Sundra measured the right measurements. They didn't look at LDL and HDL cholesterol, which is 1963 medicine and a useless metric. They looked at the particle test. They looked at A1C. They looked at inflammatory measures, inflammatory cytokines. They looked at the right things that predict heart disease. You know what they found? The amount of fat in the diet didn't matter a whit. Risk went up as the amount of carbohydrate went up. So in conclusion, you guys make a fantastic product. You should be proud of it. It can be and is being made sustainably. That message needs to get out there. And the myths about the dietary dangers of palm need to be exploded and exposed for the myths that they are. And thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Gordon, for a very inspiring talk. Um, one thing that I would like to, to inform you is that we will definitely invite you in our future engagement. <laughs> <We don't> have... <laughs> All you. right. Okay. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we have heard from our four eminent speakers, starting from the palm oil functionality and versatility, versatility in finished food products, followed by the palm oil processing and industrial contaminants, and then the potential of palm oil phytonutrients in cancer management, and to sum it up, uh, the truth about palm oil from uh, Dr. Borden. Up upon hearing all those, we have uh, now come to the q and session. Uh, for this session, we, um, we have more or less about one hour, slightly more than one hour. And um, as what I've mentioned just now, uh, what I will do is I will, uh, you know, with the help of my colleagues, I will uh, look at all the questions that was posted and I will read them uh, and uh, point them to uh, our specific uh, speakers. Okay, um, question number one. Okay, um, to take advantage of uh, the presence of our four eminent speakers, we will try to minimize policy questions. Um, you know, um, we would like to take advantage of the presence of uh, Professor Gupta and also uh, Dr. Bowden and uh, Dr. Prakash. So uh, most of the questions relating to policy, uh, we will try to address that on a different uh, avenue. Okay, to begin with, um, this is a question that was posted to Dr. Prakash. Um, 
Dr. Prakash, you did mention about lubricant uh, use of soft oil. Uh, palm oil products also used in this application. What additives and stabilizers are added to it for this application? Dr. Prakash. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, especially, I am not expert on the lubricants, but I know palm oil also can use uh, in the lubricants oil. And there are several research already done using the palm oil. And there are different types of additives you can use uh, in the lubricants, like a propylene glycol, uh, emulsifier also needed uh, if you want to have some kind of interface, if you want to reduce interfacial tension and a glycol store, or still you need maybe like a chelating agent, EDTA, or anti-forming agent, DMPS. So depending on your lubricant application, you can use different types of the additives. All right, thank you, Dr. Prakash. Uh, Dr. Azmir, uh, you seem to have uh, got a lot of questions relating to policy matters, uh, but as I mentioned just now, uh, policy matters will be addressed on a different platform. Okay, um, Dr. Azmir, this question was posted to you by two different uh, participants. Uh, basically, they were asking about the same questions. Um, the question says that if we were to eliminate all the chloride-based contaminants from mixing or adding back into the CPO in the bill, is washing step still required? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Actually, uh, CPO washing is not required if the CPO produced contain low chloride content. So the CPO washing is proposed to remove excessive chloride levels in CPO. So if the mills or even the plantation has the capability to have a stringent quality assurance to ensure that the chloride content in the CPO is minimal, CPO washing is not necessary. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Azmil. Uh, Prof. Gupta, uh, is that a compound when consumed with all palm phenolics will cancel out or diminish all palm phenolics abilities in treating cancer? Is there a compound in oil palm phenolics which will cancel its effects? Yes. Um, not to my knowledge. So not what we have seen, the oil palm phenolics is a mixture as opposed to tocotrienol. So tocotrienol is basically a mixture of the four isomers of tocotrienol, as well as it has some tocopherols, uh, the other four isomers, which are commonly sold as vitamin E. Uh, the oil palm phenolics are a bigger group of molecules. Uh, it has caffeine, shikimic acid, uh, catechuric acid, benzoic acid, and to my knowledge, all of them have, or most of them have antioxidant activity, anti-inflammatory activity, and now lately we have shown that it has anti-carcinogenic activity as well. So I, 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 do, I don't think it's within that. Uh, there could obviously be some oxidative molecules outside when you're consuming some foods which could negate the activity of the phenolics. But that is always um, a situation of oxidative balance in the body. You're always having some level of antioxidants and some not. And so the idea is to have a higher number of antioxidants than the, uh, to, uh, than the oxidants to keep your oxidative, oxidative stress to a minimum. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, we move on to Dr. Gordon. Well, Dr. Gordon, as you mentioned, uh, there is no conclusive outcome that saturated fat is associated with uh, cardiovascular disease, including the meta-analysis you shared. However, many health professionals still believe that it is the biggest enemy of, for cardiovascular disease. Uh, what would you do to change their mind? I, it, you know, it depends on whose mind you want to change. Uh, this is something that I have learned in my, in, uh, in my former career getting a psychology degree. When you're talking to people who really are research-driven, you have to show them the studies. All right. You've got 2014 Annals of Internal Medicine. You've got the British Med Medical Journal 2017. Zoe Harcom's article showing that the science does not support the dietary guidelines. That research is pretty impeccable, and it's not in weird little journals. When you're talking to people, though, who have emotional connections to those ideas, it's a whole different ballgame. 
Uh, and there are people who just, this is in their blood. They believe it. They believed it for, for years. And it will, take a, it will take a longer time and maybe more personal examples, maybe knowing people that have been on high fat diets and didn't get heart disease and in fact are losing weight and looking better. And uh, it's slowly, I, I think the channels of information will be different. I, I was at a presentation uh, at, at a company that I consult with the other day when they were talking about um, getting nutrition information out to the public. And they, they had surveyed the sources of information that influence buying. And nutritionist was like fourth on, they're out of four, nutritionist was fourth on the list in, in, in four of the different things and, and didn't even make the list in other demographics. People listen to their friends. They listen to their doctors. They listen to the hairdressers. They listen to the, and, and those, or they read an article. So I think the way you change those people, the ones that aren't show me the research, the way you change them is by what kind of we're doing. Telling people, I tell everyone who will listen about saturated fat. I give them my book. I explain it in as much detail as they want. And I think as these messages get on, and they are getting out there, you've got a lot of people, a lot of communities in the fasting community and, and, and the bulletproof coffee community and all of these little subgroups that actually support higher fat, lower carb eating. And they're doing well and they're beginning to penetrate the general consciousness. I see magazines devoted to this in the supermarket. So I think progress is being made, but it, it is made very, very slowly at the policy level. We will still continue to see, uh, probably, I'm sorry to say, for, for many years, limits on saturated fat, advice to not eat animal products because of saturated fat. And I think this information, it'll, it will be slow changing, but it is changing. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, no wonder that you are such a celebrity there, Dr. Warden. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really not, but that's very sweet of you. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Prakash, um, as we all know, palm oil does require hydrogenation, does not require hydrogenation. Could you explain why sometimes cookies or biscuits has hydrogenated palm oil in their ingredients? Will the final product contain trans fat? Yeah, usually the you depending on the application whether you would like to do hydrogenation or not. So if you want to do some kind of shortening or margarine, then you can use as a hard stock as a hydrogenated palm oil because this hydrogenation also you can use as a partial or fully hydrogenation. So definitely, if you create the partial hydro, there is trans fat issue. But if you make the fully hydro, then there is no any issue of the trans fat. But uh, you cannot use 100% fully hydrogenated palm oil uh, in the cookies. You should blend with other oils or you can make similar because solid fat, fat content is very important for, to, to use in the final application. That's why whether you want to do the hydrogenation process or not, that is just depending on your application, you can decide how much hydrogenation you need or whether you need to use as a fractionated instead of hydrogenation. So sometimes most of the application, if you do the fractionation also, you can get similar properties as a hydrogenation. But sometimes hydrogenation can give some specific properties, especially in the uh, elastic uh, properties. So that you cannot get from the fractionation. So some people are still using a small amount of hydrogenated palm oil. All right. Okay. So meaning to say that you can't really run away from uh, having some uh, portion of uh, trans fat. Is that we are trying to say? Yeah. If you use the partial hydro, yes, there are still there are some possibility to have a trans fatty acid. But if you use uh, the fractionated one or fully hydrogenated one, then you can em eliminate the trans fatty acid. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Azmil. Um, EU is studying, uh, actively studying on the mineral oil saturated hydrocarbon uh, and mineral oil aromatic hydrocarbon in vegetable oil. Could you advise the current level of both contaminants in CPO, RBDPO, RBDPOL, and RBDPST? Is there any mitigation strategies to control MOSH and more? All right, thank you for the question. So before I answer that question, we have first need to harmonize and establish the standard method for Mosh and Moa. Yeah, I agree that there are many publications have reported 
the analysis of motion muah, but they are not being harmonized. So for MPOB, we have to ensure that our method is harmonized and the result that we produce is comparable with others before we uh, going to establish a database for the levels of mosh and moi in palm oil and palm oil products. So the mitigation steps for mosh and moi is more on the practice at the mills as well as the estates because as you are all aware of, the presence of mineral oil is coming from the lubricant either from the transportation as well as the machinery at the mills or refineries. So it's more on how we manage our processing. For example, like if we have a proper uh, setup or proper management on how we can prevent leakage or contact of our oil from blue beacon, that is one of the preventive measures that we can do. Because once the mosh and moa is present in the palm oil is, is very difficult to remove unless you have other process which might be expensive if you decide to use adsorbent to eliminate the presence of mosh and moa in palm oil products. Thank you. All right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the uh, uh, explanation. Okay. Uh, Prof Gupta. Okay. Um, uh, we understand that phenolics and tocotrienol shows very good results in uh, tumor and anti cancer studies. Uh, is there any good potential value of these nutrients in other diseases? Thank you. Great question. So, um, tocotrienols actually have been uh, studied for a longer time than oil palm phenolics. And there have been many studies using tocotrienols in other disease states, such as cardiovascular. There is a lot of data on the stroke patients. Uh, I think it is from a group, um, Chandan Sen's group looked at it as well. Yeah. And um, <coughs> There has, uh, there's currently a clinical study um, on renal patients, which I'm part of actually. So this is a human trial, which is going on at Wayne State University and the PI is Pramod Khosla. So we are looking at that in kidney patients with good results. Um, so so, so um, definitely tocotrienols are very, very versatile, partly because of their antioxidative uh, power. They are very powerful antioxidants, and that is what helps them. And, you know, chronic diseases, for the most part, have um, inflammation and oxidation as their backbone. So any disease which is um, occurring as a result of chronic inflammation and oxidation is going to be benefited by tocotrienols. Now, oil palm phenolics have been studied less although there are uh, a lot of groups around the world who are studying it uh, on different, uh, at different levels. In my other project, actually, I'm looking at the effect of oil palm phenolics in Alzheimer's model. And uh, that is very, very interesting and very um, exciting, actually, the results from there, because Alzheimer's is obviously on the rise and there's a lot of people who need help with that disease. So uh, I am looking at that as well, and uh, but the data from that has not been published so far. All right. Okay. Uh, in relation to that, uh, has there been any um, live patient tests or clinical tests on live patient in the US or elsewhere in the in the last few years, with respect to the uh, tocotrienols and 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 OPP? So. Uh, Tocotrienols, as I said, are ahead of OPP in, mm -hmm. the, in the research work. Um, mm -hmm. The tocotrienols we do, we, there are a number of studies, uh, human trials. Um, as I said, I'm part of one right now, which is ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, oil palm phenolics, there are fewer studies and uh, the number of patients involved is very low. So the N is lower. So I think we need to work more on that, um, on that sphere, on that phase to see the actual um, effect in a, um, you know, a larger randomized clinical trial on oil, oil palm phenolics. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bowden, um, what is your view on high saturated fat like consuming coconut oil and red palm oil as supplement in keto diet? Oh, I think they're both wonderful for that. Uh, you know, it's interesting that some of the research actually shows that saturated fat behaves very differently in an environment where there are not a high, where there is not a high carbohydrate intake. 
So a, a lot of, uh, there's, there's really no reason not to have saturated fat when it comes from healthy sources. The, the, the message that I try to get out about saturated versus unsaturated is that a better division, a better way of dichotomizing fat would be toxic versus non-toxic. So you can take an unsaturated fat like canola oil, you can put it in the fryer at McDonald's and use it for seven days like they do, cooling it off at night, reheating it in the day, or like many fast food, I don't wanna get sued by McDonald's, but this is a very common practice in the restaurant industry and they change the oil once a week. Well, that, satur that unsaturated healthy fat is now a toxic waste dump of, of, of carcinogens and trans fats and, and just stuff that shouldn't be there. Whereas a saturated fat from palm oil, from coconut oil, that's it's non-GMO, it's not been treated with high, high heat. I mean, it's a wonderful fat. So we need to, to break people's association of bad with saturated and good with unsaturated, because believe me, some of these unsaturated fats are much, much worse for us than saturated fats ever were. So, so uh, I see when, when you're on a keto diet, you have to get more fat and less, you gotta get your calories from good fat. And as far as I'm concerned, olive oil, key, uh, uh, palm oil, avocado oil, coconut oil, these are the ones that should constitute the bulk of the calories when you're on the keto diet. And, and the saturated fat, I will go so far as to say even saturated fat from humanely and healthily raised, pasture-raised animals, 100% pasture-raised, not fed grain, not fed antibiotics, not fed steroids and, and bovine growth hormone and raised on pasture, that's a health food as far as I'm concerned. I never get the low fat version of that. I don't care how much saturated fat is in that meat. So my answer is, yeah, I don't limit saturated fat at all when it comes from healthy sources and it hasn't been made toxic by overheating and chemical processing. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Borden. Okay, um, Dr. Prakash. Um, okay. Um, can palm oil be refined to a level that it can be used as a solvent for ingredients for food grade products and uh, that can replace the current sunflower oil in terms of non coagulation at low temperature? What is your comment on, on uh, this particular issue? Uh, if you want to compare apple to apple, definitely not. Sunflower oil, the IV is already high, uh, like a 120 around. And then palm oil, in, if you do uh, refine or uh, fractionation, you can get a uh, high IV is around 67. So that's why the, if you see the perspective of the IV, then definitely you cannot compare apple to apple. But in the application wise, definitely you can use in the like a cooking or frying application, you can use a high IV oil in. Uh, like IB 60 to 67, you can use. But in the low uh, temperature wise, if you, uh, you, you want to use, then uh, palm oil in is most suitable on the high temperature countries like the Middle East countries for the cooking and the frying application, especially the cooking application. Because if you low temperature, then there could be some clouding issue. All right, okay, thank you, Dr. Prakash. Dr. Azmil, um, okay. Um, this question is regarding the uh, 3-MCPDE. Okay. Um, if chlorine is known to be the precursor of 3-MCPD, does MPOB focus on studies removing the organic chloride instead of total chloride? Is there any data to show the relationship of on this organic chloride and 3-MCPD? Okay, thank you for the question. Actually, this type of question has been uh, raised by many uh, industry members. But before I answer, so I we also have a hypothesis on that. If true, if is it true that in uh, organic chloride is the precursor of 3-MCPD in processed palm oil rather than total chloride content, why do we need to wash the CPO in the first place? Because if only organic chloride is the role, it play the main role in this formation. Even without any washing, the 3 mcbd should be lower. So from our hypothesis, the total chloride 
which comprises of inorganic and organic chloride play a role on the formation of true MCPD. However, we are also in the studying on the effect of organic chloride to show the, whether the hypothesis is true or not by developing a method to distinguish between organic and inorganic. From there, we will do several studies to see the presence of organic and inorganic respectively, or in combination of organic and organic on the formation of 3MCPD when we do refining at our labs. So from there, we will share our findings on how the behavior of 3MCPD with regard to whether the chloride is organic or not in the near future. Thank you. So um, how long has this study been done, Dr. Azmin? No, actually, we just proposed this year because- Okay. Starting from this year, so we have to, you know, we have to answer back to the industry on this question. So we have turned out this question from the industry on the research to see the effect of this. All right. How long will it take for you to come up with some, uh, you know, outcome of the research uh, on this particular issue? See, we, so we try to get it done by less than two years or preferably around one and a half years. Really? Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Azmi. Okay, uh, Prof Gupta. Um, okay. Um, okay, uh, it is interesting to learn that dietary or pump phenolics can reduce tumor progression in pancreatic cancer. Uh, would you be able to share on the dosage required in this particular study? It's okay. Uh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think on in the in vitro model, we were using oil palm phenolics at 15 to 30 parts per million. This is a concentrated um, solution that is made after the extraction procedure. And we use it in uh, um, at that level. And um, I don't know if that's, and um, is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, uh, we haven't done anything on human yet, right? So uh, yeah. that is the best, yeah, that's yeah. the best uh, guide that we can actually get. Okay. Right. All right, uh, Prof Gupta, uh, to you again. Um, so when we put together the three MCPD issues and GE, uh, would it be beneficial contents of nutrients in PAM uh, that will help to negate the alleged carcinogenic properties of these two continents? I don't think this has been tested. Mm -hmm. so, so there's no way that you can correlate them. It would be a speculation on my behalf. I think Dr. <laughs> Azam has a better idea about the MCPD. All right, okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gupta. Uh, okay, um, Dr. Borden. Um, okay, um, this, you, 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 these questions. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, it looks like most of the uh, negative uh, perceptions of palm oil come from the uh, 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 advanced uh, world, I mean, especially the Western world. Um, uh, may I know, how was the feedback uh, from your audiences in the US from your misbusting experience? For my, excuse me, my which? from your misbusting oh, experience? Yeah. Uh, well, surprisingly, I have gone on television sometimes very, very uh, sure that I have a very on message about the sustainability thing. And I have found a, that in certain pockets of the country, they're very much unaware that there's even a controversy about it. They have not heard all of this stuff. And, and if I even bring it up, it's, it, sometimes I don't bring it up because they haven't even heard about it and I don't want to put it in their heads. I think that it, that it is not as widespread. It, it, it hasn't reached every single pocket of the, of the American public. It's important to realize that there are huge swathes of America that don't even know what protein is. <laughs> or, or I'm not kidding. I mean, they, 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 their, their knowledge of what constitutes each macronutrient or vitamins or minerals is, is beyond rudimentary. It, 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 and so not everybody is aware of this. Now, the environmentalists 
the people who are concerned with that, and, and, and we all are, um, they, they are more likely to respond to the memes and to the very shortened kinds of, yes, palm oil is destroying the environment. And we really have to delve in with that. And, and, and there are a number of arguments that we can make, but each, as I said before about the saturated fat issue, each argument has to be tailored to that demographic. You don't want to go in to middle America where you're trying to tell them, look, what you've heard about saturated fat is not that here is this wonderful oil, and then try in a very short time to also introduce the issue of how it's farmed and how it's brought to the table. That's not the audience for that. When, when you've got social media and you've got clusters in, in big cities where they are concerned about these things and they actually read the bad press, that's where we have to really combat the, the misinformation. And, and as I said before, I, I'm not even sure who, you know, somebody funds that, somebody puts that out, somebody benefits from continuing to say that while we are doing all these wonderful things and fighting for sustainability and fighting for certification and fighting for these different levels of certification on the products that they're, that we're doing bad. I mean, there is, there is somebody or some, it seems to me there are people who have been, they're interested benefit from us being blamed for that. And we must, I mean, as an industry, we, that has to be chipped at piece by piece. We have to, we have, to have uh, we, I spoke actually um, at an event in Atlanta where we, where it was very, very climate aware and greenhouse emissions aware. And these were what we call the green market, the, the light green market. Um, which is which is basically people who are they're not activists they're not on picket lines but they're very aware of these kinds of things and they need to be shown they need to be shown through visual and through you know t uh, talking um, what is being done in t to right the 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 wrongs that have been done you know maybe decades ago by rogue countries they're not being done now and that message has to get out but it has to be catered to the, each, each individual market. We don't want to go in there with people who never even knew there was a, a, a crisis or a controversy and tell them that there's a controversy. We want to tell right. yeah, them. Not, not, yeah. Okay, uh, Dr. Gordon, um, based on your experience in engaging the public, how many percent of the uh, American population that you think that, you know, will be very uh, receptive to, uh, you know, getting the right information for them to make wise decisions? In, in terms of, uh, you know, accepting or, you know, uh, dissenting palm oil? What, what percentage do I think? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear the question. Okay, what, what percentage of the public in the American, I mean, the American public it will resent, uh, it will actually uh, accept uh, positive uh, information on palm oil? And how many percent would you think that uh, no matter what you say, they will not, you know, accept whatever the facts that you are trying to share with them? That's a wonderful question. And it's a bigger question than just about this subject. It's, it's kind of about, I, my personal thing based on the, no science, but, but just general, is that there's usually 10% of, of any group that is firmly in one camp on, let's say the left, and they're not gonna move and research isn't gonna change them and opinion isn't gonna do, that's where they are. And there's another 10% that's on the other side that is just as vehement and just as sure they're right. And that, and that 80% in between, you have some leverage. That mm. 80% in between, it's the same in politics. I mean, these two sides <laughs> are the biggest microphones. All and right. You think that there are only two sides, and there are there. Most people are persuadable if you okay. have the kind of persuasion that they accept. All right. Another Can question. Yes, yes, Dr. Prabhupada, yeah. So um, looking at our percentage of vac uh, people who are getting vaccinated or not against COVID, you can uh -huh. get a pretty good idea about how persuasive people can be or not be as All a right. general rule. Yeah, true, very true. Okay. Uh, people just don't want to believe in the science and others do. All right, <laughs> that is very true. Um, another leading question to uh, Dr. Borden. Um, you see, do you think that uh, short messaging uh, will be more effective than uh, bombastic uh, messaging that comes from the scientific journals in trying to uh, influence the perception of the uh, public? 
I do. I mean, sadly, I write books, or I used to, I used to write lots of books. People don't really read anymore. They certainly don't read long form. And I, 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 there's been, even on YouTube, a, a tendency to go for videos under three minutes because people <laughs> just don't watch. And this, this is someone who grew up on books and reads books and loves books and has, you know, this is a very sad thing. But I do think people are used to getting shorter, more succinct messages, which is both good news and bad news because it allows for a lot of manipulation on the other side and, you know, powerful, strong slogans and things like that have, have power. Um, but I do really think that there are different styles of getting information. Some people are very thoughtful. They consider everything. They like to see different. Um, some people are just, they make up their minds. And I think it, the message, we have to have like a repertoire of messages for different situations, just like you have a different playbook if you're a football team, depending on who you're playing. And I think we kind of have to, we have to, we have, to have messages for, for the people who want to see the literature and the science. We have to have messages for people who have the emotional connection and don't want to see orangutan habitats destroyed. Neither do I, neither do you, and we need to show them that they're not being. So th that will be a message for one. Another person might need to see a, a journal article saying that saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease. So I think the message has to be catered to the audience. I think that's an important, I, I work with, you guys probably know it, with an agency that studies this to figure out like what exactly message is going to be heard in this demographic. And, and there is a science to it, I guess. I don't do that. I just go where they tell me, but I, I do, I have noticed that there is different receptivity to different types of messages depending on who you're talking to. All right, okay, and another leading question, uh, Dr. Bowden. Okay, um, we have seen that a lot of this negative perception was created by policymakers in advanced countries. Uh, in, could, in advanced countries, uh -huh. like for example, in EU, for example, um, they created negative perception which actually influenced the consumers you know, understanding on the whole issues. How do we address this kind of uh, situation? They are the policy makers. It's, I think it's beyond my pay scale. <laughs> I, I knew how we could affect policy makers. Believe me, I was, uh -huh. um, I, 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 uh, I always defer to Mike Danielson. He's a, the, the head of the company that, because he is very, very, in tune with like what demographics respond to why what mm -hmm. messages not every demographic responds to a messenger like me i might be too colloquial or too entertaining to some audiences and others that might prefer a much more scientific much more objective kind of presentation so i i think you have to kind of think on your feet with that and be and just be flexible and have a lot of ways to kind of make inroads into changing people's perceptions and that's probably true in everything Okay, thank you, Dr. Gupta. And, uh, uh, Dr. Gordon. Okay, uh, Dr. Gupta, I, we have got a question for you here. Um, um, okay, is there any ongoing research uh, towards application of tocotrienol and tocopherol in combating COVID-19? Um, no. Short answer, no. Okay. Is there any possibility that it can be used to uh, at least minimize the impact of the uh, uh, pandemic by relying on this tocotrienol and tocopherol? It's a far stretch because there is no data on it, but tocotrienols mm -hmm. and tocopherols both are anti-inflammatory agents and inflammation is part of the uh, disease condition. So mm. once you say once a person has it, then that would help to alleviate some of the um, issues related to inflammation which occur in the process. But mm -hmm. um, COVID of course is a viral disease. And so there hasn't been a test on that. Having said that, um, oil palm phenolics do have shikimic acid as a, a very important constituent of it. And shikimic acid does have antiviral activity. So although it has not been tested against COVID specifically, uh, not COVID-19 specifically, um, it has been tested against other uh, viruses or microbes, shikimic acid, not, not oil palm phenolics as a whole. 
Mm-hmm. But that may have some potential, and there will be. Um, actually, I thought about that even when just COVID started to, uh, you know, look at some of these cells um, against uh, the virus. But uh, uh, we haven't done it yet. But that is a possibility to um, evaluate the uh, efficacy of oil palm phenolics against um, antiviral uh, conditions as an antiviral. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um... Dr. Prakash, um, what is your opinion on consumers' perception that palm-based margarine is a fake butter? Why is palm oil used to replace dairy fat? Uh, short answer is dairy fat is expensive. Uh-huh. And then if you want a cheaper version, then palm oil is one of the solution to replace the dairy fat. And perception wise, yeah, it is sometimes if, if European countries, yeah, perception of the palm oil is different, but other countries is still palm oil is the most reliable and cheaper source of the alternatives of the dairy fat. So if you like to add or replace the dairy fat, then palm oil is one of the solutions. All right. In other words, um, there's no issue about fake butter or things like that. No, no. No, all right. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Azmil, um, does MPOP have got any formulation to produce lubricants from palm oil? Uh, if there is, uh, why don't we push for this application so that the whole industry switches to the use of palm oil and eliminate the more and more issue comprehensively? Um, got any comments on that? Okay, thank you for the for the suggestion, yeah, actually MPOB has the formulation for lubricant, but for only light equipment. But for uh, heavy machinery, the lubricant need to be re-established, the formulation, because we have to ensure that the lubricant can withstand and durable at high temperature as well as for prolonged operation. But it's a very good incentive and there are some uh, talk with the synthetic company Kluber on how MPOB and the company to work together to formulate the alternative lubricant to address the presence of uh, Mosh and Moi. I also want to emphasize that even though the food grade lubricant is the alternative for replacement of the technical grade of Mosh and Moi, but we have to bear in mind that the detection of Mosh and Moi is based on the carbon number, regardless whether it's a food grade or technical grade. That's why there are some companies who are producing synthetic lubricant, which have different formulation and chemical structure, which is up to eight times higher as compared to lubricant all made of mineral oil. So I think this is a good platform and the way forward on how we can you know, offer to the industry on the alternative and cheaper lubricant we not necessarily have to use the plant-based um, lubricant, but the fastest way that we can go is to at least have a blend of you know, plant-based and uh, uh, mineral oil-based lubricant to have a short term and moving forward, we can have 100% synthetic made of plant-based. Thank you. All right, All right. great. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Prof Gupta, okay, um, I think Cancer is becoming very, very uh, important nowadays. Uh, people are trying ways and means uh, how to address uh, this uh, disease. Okay, um, can we introduce palm phytochemical to cancer patients that are currently undergoing chemotherapy? That's a great question. So uh, if you think about the tocotrienol work that I presented, we did um, look at the combination of uh, tocotrienols with cisplatin, which is the current drug um, against lung cancer. So in our study, we saw that the combination works much better than either the cisplatin alone or the tocotrienol alone. So, right. um, so, the, so it has a synergistic effect, right? So, um, so doing the, uh, looking at the two together would be ideal. And uh, since, um, I mean, actually, the tocotrienol work that I presented has not been funded by MPOB or MPOC, so it's independent of that. 
So mm-hmm. I have been looking for um, uh, funding or you know ways to conduct a small pilot study to evaluate that in uh, humans. So that is something I really want to do, and I've been wanting to do it for a long time because I see a potential based on our data. Yeah, probably we can discuss a little more on that with MPOC. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Okay, uh, Prof Gupta, another question uh, related to cancer. Um, what is the recommended uh, dosage for tocotrienol intake per day as prevention for cancer? Does tocotrienol also show good results on prostate cancer prevention? Um, most of the clinical studies which are being done with tocotrienols use uh, 200 milligrams times two per day. Uh, twice so that, a day. Yes, twice a day. You can use... Uh, you know, a single dose of more, um, you know, higher potency, but normally it is done so that the pharmacokinetics is such that you would nice need to do two, two a day. All right. So okay. That's how it is done. Yeah. I, I hope that will help some of our patients there. Sorry. I hope that will help some of our patients who yes. are seeking for answers, you know? Yeah. I, I really hope so. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. What was the okay. second question? I forget. Um, the, quest, the question was getting on answer to say, um, will, will it have any positive results on prostate cancer prevention? Yeah, uh, prostate cancer is actually easier to, I mean, the survival rate is much, much better than uh, lung or pancreatic. Uh, I would think, and this is again a uh, speculation because there is uh, no concrete study on pro- prostate cancer, but I would think that it would work because it has worked on multiple other cancer types like breast, colon, um, I think GI cancers, so. All right, okay, thanks. Thank thanks. You. Okay, Dr. Bowden, uh, there is a request from uh, some of our participants. How do we get copies of your book? Uh, do you have any e- e-book version of your publication? Uh, my books, are, I wish that I, controlled that they're all on Amazon and, and I would be flattered and told if you bought them, but I don't have them for sale. <laughs> they, you have to get them from Amazon. I buy them on Amazon. <laughs> all right. Okay. okay um, uh, also to you, uh, Dr. Borden. Yes. Um, may I know, or oh, uh, there is a, a question from one of the participants. What would be the uh, amount of uh, palm oil that needs to be consumed daily uh, per body weight? And is fish oil considered part of the essential oil that we have to consume every day? Um, Well, there's two different questions. Let me do the fish oil one first. I absolutely believe fish oil should be consumed every day. I, uh, I, I consider it to be one of the four basic supplements that will benefit most people. I'm very much an individualist when it comes to nutritional recommendations. I don't believe in one size fits all on any level for anything, but I, but people ask me frequently, well, what's the basic ones? And I believe fish oil, magnesium, vitamin D, and a multiple are the four basic things that just about everyone would benefit from. Um, We don't, I could talk about this for an hour. We don't get enough omega-3. We get far, far too much omega-6. Omega-6 is a pro-inflammatory. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory, as you know. They compete for the same enzyme, delta-6 desaturase. Uh, we get way too much vegetable oil and not enough of fish oil. So I do think that needs to be supplemented. That said, I don't know that palm oil needs to be supplemented. And I don't usually like to tell anyone what the percentage of, of their diet should be of anything. I just think that they're very, very individual kind of thing. If you're on a keto diet, then most of your diet is coming from, most of your calories are coming from fat. If you're on a paleo diet, maybe most of your uh, 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 calories are coming actually surprisingly from plant matter, even though it's not processed foods. Um, the original paleo diets were about 60, 65% plant matter and 35% animal. So I, I think the percentages, I, I, my nutrition advice, my take home advice to audiences everywhere is three words, eat real food. And the rest is details. And we can argue and discuss and debate the best percentages of macronutrients, the best number of calories, the best, all of that. 
But the, the advice that trumps all of it over the amount of, or percentage of any of these macronutrients, even the really healthy elements of the diet, is that if you start with actual real food, and by real food, I mean food that your grandmother, your great grandmother would have recognized this food and known what to do with, then all the rest will follow is really details. And, and percentages don't matter as much as the quality of the food. And palm oil is one of those foods that is very high quality and is a real food. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Borden. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before uh, we proceed, uh, I've got one final question, which is, I think, um, uh, which is one of the uh, problems that we are facing nowadays. Uh, uh, this, the, 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 the deception of palm oil, despite uh, this is probably addressed to all the panels, uh, especially uh, Dr. Bowden and Prof. Uh, Gupta, uh, the deception on palm oil, despite uh, its health benefits and sustainability impact, could be due to superiority of palm oil in its demand and profitability compared to the other oils. Uh, though a lot of messages are hitting the West, how could we change this economic politics in the coming years to come? Any response from the panel members? All I would say is that I've seen it done in, not, in the non-food area. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had brands, it, it, clothing brands, that I grew up with as a child that were associated with older people, very conservative, very boring. They were brands that had, they, that that's what people thought of them. And I've seen, I'm thinking of one Abercrombie and Fitch, which somehow transformed into the hippest, coolest. It's in all the malls. It is a young brand. It changed its audience. And I don't know, I mean, there are marketing geniuses way better than I, Mike Danielson would know much more about this than I do, but the DNA of the company, they, they, they changed the perception of the DNA of the company. And I think we can do that. I think it takes lots of images, and maybe it shows farming and animals. Maybe it shows families farming together. Maybe it, it finds a, a couple of key words that we can associate with it. And um, I, I believe it can be done. I wish that I knew enough about marketing. I'd be a millionaire to know how to do it. But I've seen it done in other industries. So I know it can be done here. All right. Any comment from you, Prof Gupta? I'm not in marketing either, but uh, <laughs> um, my own perception is that uh, to change um, the thinking of a large number of people, a population, usually one has to target the younger people. So mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the teenage group or even younger, if they believe in it, it usually spreads. And it's right. usually accepted by a larger population. Uh, uh, if you're targeting the older people, it is just boring and not people are <laughs> going to not like it, as you said, uh, Dr. Bowden. So um, I think it's the younger fraction because they are the ones who are more active against uh, environmental concerns. They have more concerns and they're very yeah. legitimate. So if you can somehow uh, convince them, then it spreads more. Yeah, it's something like the McDonald uh, story when they first come to uh, the Asian part of the world, where their focus was on the younger generation by offering them small toys. I mean, it won't last long, but it's toys. To kids, toys are toys, right? So yeah, probably that could be a good strategy. I, okay, I have, any com I have a yeah. comment, if I may. Um, there's a concept in social psychology called moral reframing. And, and the basic idea of it is, when you're talking to people who maybe are adversarial or have a different position, you find a common ground, mm -hmm. reframe it. That's what, we're all parents. We're all policemen. We're all on the same football team. We're, you, you connect with them in some way that you can find. So with the environmentalists, we have to approach them like, we care about this. We all, you environmentalists and us, care about this. We're together in this. And that's why 
we want to show you what we're really doing for the environment with this. And that if, right. if you ban palm oil, the way the memes are saying, just, you know, boycott palm oil, you're basically putting money in the hands of the people who are doing what you don't want to see done. And we have to align with that value and show them that we're on that side. That's the message we've got to get out there. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wooden. How about from uh, Dr. Prakash and Dr. Azmi? Is there any, any views on that? Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Rosen, I think I would, I would like to give a view on the perspective of food safety. So even though if you look at the food safety issues with regard to palm oil, it looks very unfair. But for us, it's, we should take it positively to, to improve further on the quality and the standard of palm oil. Because at the end of the day, palm oil is needed no matter how the consumption is keep on increasing, the population is keep on increasing. I'm sure that the acceptance of GMO oil is getting more concerned by the consumer. So palm oil is, at the end of the day, is the most versatile oil for many applications. They will require palm oil in any how. Thank you. All right, thank you. How about you, Dr. Prakash? Uh, I, I think this is very big issue, uh, but yeah, sustainability is usually the have an issue. But my understanding is this is just a kind of agenda or the rumor people are doing, especially in the Western countries, uh, European countries. Uh, but that is what I agree is uh, youngsters should understand what is the reality, what is the real situation, ground situation whether it is really impacting the environment or not, whether it has the real problem or not. Then if we need, if we convince those youngsters, then definitely they are the uh, leaders for the world. So they will understand the, what is the situation and then they will lead the world. So I think we have to convince them to showing the real scenario of the palm oil perspective. All right, thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the Q&A session. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for your active participation. Um, there was about 285 participants, uh, especially for those who have actually posted questions and the, uh, the responses from the speakers. Uh, to our four eminent speakers, I would like to congratulate and thank you for your well-presented presentation and for your responses to the question asked. And I hope that with the, questions, uh, with the responses that you actually gave to the questions will change uh, the negative perceptions of palm oil, if not a lot, but at least uh, a bit. Uh, before I end this webinar, I would like to also thank Inje Kamal and the SESD team from MPOC to assist me in moderating this webinar. And finally, uh, I would like to, to announce our future uh, program scheduled on the 15th of September. Um, the focus in this uh, upcoming series will be on palm, to palm carotenoids in human nutrition and health. So uh, with that, thank you all for your uh, active participation and hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all speakers. Thank you all attendees. See you in our next event. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.